Okay, there's a loading bar. It's live. Wait, it's not coming. Okay, there's a loading bar. It's it's live for sure. Oh yeah, it is. It's live. Okay, there's a loading. Okay, hello, hello everyone. Um, apologies for all that have been in the waiting room. We've been uh, a painter and a writer try and do a Zoom to live stream. So the uh, the natural Luddite instincts came out and um, thank you for all of your uh, patience while we figured that out and welcome to this talk. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar, um, my name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the curator and author of Saturnine, an exhibition and a book on the work of Theodora Allen, uh, who is joining us today. And the exhibition just recently opened at Kunsthal Aarhus in Denmark. And the book is published by Moto Books in Berlin. Um, so despite the delays, Theodora and I are thrilled to be speaking in our first public program surrounding the exhibition. And before we get started, I wanted to thank the partners that have made the show and the publication possible. Um, the support of Bloom and Poe in Los Angeles, Kasman in New York, as well as Kunstal Aarhus, Aarhus Commune, and the Staten's Kunstford for their support of the exhibition. Um, given the alignment of both of the endeavors, the book and the show, we wanted to structure this talk in a way that allows us to speak about the ideas embedded within both projects in depth. So there will be passages of reading from certain chapters interspersed throughout today's conversation um, in order to access some of the larger concepts in Theodora's work um, and her practice at large. So the exhibition at Kunstal Aarhus is on view through July 18, 2021, closing nearly 400 years after the specific historic moment that had sparked my imagination and the impulse to curate both the show and begin writing on Theodora's paintings. Um, this moment of discovery is of Saturn's rings. So to set things up, I just wanted to read a small excerpt from the curatorial statement, and then uh, Theodora and I will continue on to the talk. On a summer evening in July 1610, under the humid Padua sky, Galileo peered through his crude telescope to discover the rings of Saturn, the furthest planet then known, twice as far as the moons of Jupiter, which were each named after the former lovers of Zeus. While Galileo set his sight on Saturn, it came into view slowly. Ancient Greek and Roman theory and later medieval psychology had correlated the four planets with each of the elements and the temporal humors. Jupiter's influence prevailed in the blood and affected a sanguine nature. Mar Mars ruled aggression. The moon was cause for an apathetic disposition. The fourth and final humor inspired by ringed Saturn was responsible for melancholy. And it's for this reason that we have the term Saturnine to describe sadness. The sight of Saturn is one of sorrow. So the book itself really takes this, um, this idea of Saturn as outlined in the curatorial statement um, and how the planet had informed an understanding of melancholy throughout the ages, uh, situating Theodora's paintings within this cultural history. Many of the subjects and the areas of research covered in this book, um, which we'll be speaking about today, are present as symbols in the works on view at Kunstal Aarhus, such as hourglasses, snakes, musical instruments, hearts, hallucinogenic plants. So um, throughout this talk, we'll go into how these motifs really come to life in Theodora's work. But I wanted to start first by inviting Theo to speak a bit about the show, um, the selection of works on view, how we sort of walk through the space and um, where the, the works themselves had been shown before and in what context and how they really come together in a different way within this show. So Theo, stage is yours. Sure, um, do we have images? Are we... we do, so I'll be scrolling through some of the uh, installation views while you speak. Um, I'm just gonna get the uh, 
screen sharing, but you can start. Okay, cool. Um, so we chose a painting from each main category of work that I've made for the past seven years. I tend to work in a serialized way where each group of paintings has a singular focus around a motif. Um, and um, um, for example, the candle series, um, the cosmic garden series or the shields. Um, so in the past, these paintings were exhibited as uh, focused bodies of work. So this is the first time the paintings um, from these different categories have all been put into conversation with each other. And um, I think that selection of work um, was meant to highlight in a larger sense um, what this world is that I'm building and, um, and reveal the connections between different works. Um, that you wouldn't necessarily have access to um, one looking just at like a singular series. Um, and I think it also shows um, the thread that runs throughout, which is really um, the formal concerns and the, the painting process itself. Um, so in the main area of the exhibition hall, we have selections of work that largely focus on the natural world. Um, the earthly elements, the cosmos, markers of time, um, and then behind the partition wall that we built, um, it breaks the space into two parts and that's the machine room where the three paintings that I made specifically for the show are from the Life Thread series. And um, in contrast, to the other work, they feel very architectural and um, it's a space where nature has been um, reorganized and compartmentalized. Um, so this slide is, let's see, we have shield paintings, which were shown at Kasman in 2019. Um, a wildfire from, I believe 2015 um, and two candle paintings. One was made specifically for the show and the other was from a show at uh, Blum and Poe in 2017. And throughout the exhibition, I mean, I know during installing it, one of our concerns also was to strike um, a repetition and a type of symmetry in the installation that mirrors what you've approached um, in the installation of your exhibitions in the past. Um, so for those viewing this image, the, the new candle painting that Theo just mentioned is this uh, sort of elemental uh, helix around a candle that, effect, that reflects the same form of the Saturn of the cosmic garden. On the wall opposite, um, the shields are also sort of placed against each other in in the space so as you're walking through the space you you see what you don't um in such a direct way in these installation images where your your gaze and your view sort of reaches a type of echo as you turn your body around the space um, which i think is an important element of the show This is, oh yeah. Oh yeah, no, so I just wanted to, you know, sort of show those, those works that everybody can get a sense of um, what was in the exhibition. And um, yeah, from there, what we're, the way that we're sort of structuring today is that um, I'll read certain passages of the book um, from each of the four chapters. So the whole book was, um, structured in four parts, but in each of those uh, parts, there are two sections, a uh, part one and a part two. And the rhythm of the book is that in each part one, there are these uh, fictional narratives, sort of non-linear non stories, but ways of accessing certain images and um, affects that are within a key painting 
that is in the second part of the chapter. Um, and each of the four sections is organized around a series of motifs. So you'll hear me, you know, before reading out the passages, saying what mo motif the, um, the chapter itself really revolved around. Um, and so I think the first place to start, which is the first chapter of the book, is entitled Fallen Saturn, an Emblem. And it's a fiction that was really inspired by the work that is on the cover and sort of the main wall of the exhibition uh, from the Cosmic Garden series. And then from there, Theo and I will discuss, you know, what the role of Saturn has been in her practice. So I will read here. The modulation of Alan's images come into being um, through a process of removal and regeneration. Paint lifted off a darkly covered surface to reveal the ground of white that is veiled behind the pigment. Before introducing more sheer layers that are gradually polluted by the addition of color, value, and opacity, as well as with the ground itself. The paintings are rooted in a necessary loss while also signaling a process of regrowth and regeneration. They exude a mel melancholic temperament yet remain generative, a state of becoming that is gently held. This paradox, the creation of an image through means of deficit and alteration is at the core of the aesthetic effect achieved across Allen's careful output. The process is a strategy of dimming the light source in the painting, as much as it is about the mediation between presence and absence. Um, and I think that this is a perfect entree, Theo, for you to speak about your, um, your process of painting. I know that for a lot of uh, people that have viewed your work primarily through a screen, they can appear quite photographic, but even when you're up close to them, it, it is, sort of an alchemy that's difficult to um, unravel. So how do you make, you know, starting from the beginning, how do you paint these works? Um, <clears throat> yeah, there is a photographic quality, I think, to some of the paintings um, in that they resemble cyanotype prints or film negatives. Um, the reason for that is that the information is largely formed out of a deficit. So a layer opacity around negative shapes and remove areas of paint to reveal the ground. Um, and in that way they hold or contain um, or conceal um, areas of luminosity. Um, and so yeah, that painting process involves this ebb and flow of adding and removing oil paint um, the ground holds these ghost images of previous marks. Um, and as that action gets repeated, the weave of the fabric gets accentuated. Um, I think what gets lost um, through reproduction is that that sort of like atmospheric quality that um, that's really apparent um, and really material in person um, that's through this sort of like, um, it almost feels like imprinting an image into or embedding it into the weave of the linen, if that makes sense. Um, it's sort of an uncanny quality that's, that does feel um, alchemical in a way. It's like um, an image that just appears. Um, Almost like all of the pigment has sunk in as a stain. Yeah. Completely flat ground. And, you know, when, when I was writing about the work, especially in this chapter, we talk about how the thing that is closest, to, that appears closest to you in the image is actually furthest away from the pigment. Um, you know, the, the white, of, nothing's ever truly white. There is this dimming where the pigment has stained the ground sort of over and over again, but the objects that come through in their pictorial depiction, for example, Saturn appears to be in the foreground of, of a painting um, is actually the furthest layer back in the wiping away of, of the painting. So, 
Right, definitely. It becomes like um, enshrouded by um, or, or like that original light source becomes sort of polluted as more layers are, are added on top of and around it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this image of Saturn, um, of the cosmic garden, I would say is, you know, certainly iconic in your practice, but also, you know, one of the strangest um, sort of compositions that that I took liberties with um, in the fiction for for this narrative is that the image appears so right and correct. It is the sort of emblem or icon for an emblem, um, but the thought to actually have a Saturn fallen into a garden is uh, much more of a concept than it is a familiar image. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak about your relationship to the format of the emblem and to give a little bit of background of how it was approached in the book. Um, emblems, you know, from the Baroque period really are these uh, forms of literature that exist on a page where there is a title called a moto, um, an image called a pictura, and a caption called a subscriptio. And what I was proposing in the first chapter, Fallen Saturn, an emblem, is that all of these three portions of an emblem get collapsed into a single image. Um, and you've, you've talked about them as um, sometimes emblems, but I know that a word that you often use in your past work are distillations. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, your relationship to emblems and these sort of essential images that permeate your practice. Sure, yeah. Um, the distillation paintings are um, where the themes and motifs across different chapters of work come into their most essential and reduced form. Um, and that is in order to create a space that is purely emblematic. Um, so those are like the candle paintings, um, the lyre harp, um, the interlocking infinity symbols and hourglasses. Um, it started, or I started the, sort of exploring that um, avenue with the candle paintings, which were, I was originally thinking of them as the maps legend to the Cosmic Garden series. And they were shown at Blum and Poe in 2017. Um, and they were separated from those paintings, but they, um, I think they, it was a space where I could explore ideas about time and space. And um, for example, like the beginning or an ending of a day is one, suite of paintings um, or the planet and the atom, which are um, the sort of macro and micro elements that are that are explored in a different way in the Cosmic Garden series. Um, so in the in the distillations, these ideas are pared down to just like a rectangle and a ring and where the ring interlocks with the rectangle tells you everything you need to know about um, you know, what that idea is. If it's Saturn, it had an extra ring for an atom, it had three rings. Um, so um, I guess as time has gone on and I've, I've like explored that series of work further, um, my ideas about it have changed as well. And it's evolved into, um, I guess I'm thinking of it more now as like the infrastructure or the bones of the work in a broader sense, rather than just like a key or legend understanding or accessing another part of the work. Um, so I'm interested in that reduction and purity of an idea into its essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sort of as the work has gone on, like you said, these, these distillations existed at first as the sort of legend um, so that you would visually pair the most bare version of that, really the geometry of the subject that was in one. Um, so like we see in the Saturn with a single ring around a candle as opposed to, 
you know, this very ornate um, and complicated image of the garden with the flora, the fauna, the, um, the Saturn, this sort of window shape um, and the distillations take on a space of their own as, as the work has progressed throughout the years, um, which will constantly be returning to throughout this talk because I think, um, you know, for all of the very dense mythology and narrative that is achieved in, in certain paintings, there are these sort of punctuations throughout your practice that are, they function like almost footnotes would in a text, um, which, you know, brings back the, the breadth of the references, but also your interest in um, not taking on all of the narrative of, of certain subjects, but really reducing them down to, to their most elemental form, um, which I think is a super important part of your practice. There, there are all of these symbolisms and narratives, but um, the stories that they tell are much more boiled down into a trope that has um, gone over history, but also it continues to be um, current and present. And I was going to move on to the next chapter, but actually I think that this is a really good space for us to talk about, you know, one of the things that, that we spoke a lot about in the book, which is your relationship to, to time and these symbols being labeled as archaic. I know that we've, we've had many disagreements about that. And, you know, have sort of come to a different understanding of, I've come to a different understanding of time and where you're pulling things from um, in your work. Maybe you can speak a bit about how these uh, symbols are actually, you know, very present for you in daily life. Yeah, I mean, I think that what, what gives them strength and power and sort of um, timelessness, for lack of a better word, is that they are incredibly like elemental and um, technology comes and goes, but these things are like the original source of um, so like a you know like a candle may be outmoded by a flashlight, but like fire <laughs> would never be outmoded. Um, time, um, you know, there's no way to like an infinity loop can't be um, replaced. Um, So I feel like the reason why we see these symbols cropping up time and again is because they hold um, like a truth and a purity that, um, that still is quite resonant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the second chapter of this book uh, is actually on your use of moths wildfire and hallucinogenic plants, sort of bringing these, these three enduring symbols under the same heading. Um, but your comment just now about, about fire, you know, it doesn't go away, but it also takes on new meaning in, um, in our current moment where wildfires are also a sign of climate change and a sign of an imprint of technology on on the natural world without um, making such a clear distinction. It sort of crops up in, in the, um, the chaos of, of nature and um, how it has, how nature is really, the, has this ability to react to things that we don't see um, until we see its reaction. And so I wanted to read a passage, um, the beginning of this, chapter, um, which sort of starts by describing a butterfly migration, um, but trans transfers into some of these other um, contemporary concerns. 
On March 11, 2019, the largest migration in the history of the Nesquipartee, a species of butterfly colloquially known as the Painted Lady, took flight across Southern California. At the height of the spring migration, the saturation of butterflies in the air turned blue skies into a type of glinting expanse from La Cienega Boulevard to across the Interstate 105, suspended like the particles of a snow globe. The familiar sight of migration, the constant cascading movement, had fallen out of recent memory. Years previous, the breeding of painted ladies was in steep decline and numbers were reaching historic lows due to drought, which, is, which had caused less desert flora. Yet on February 14, 2019, winter rains in the Coachella Valley measured more than the collective annual rainfall years prior. An estimated 1 billion butterflies migrated from the deserts of northern Mexico to across Southern California before settling to the breeding grounds in Oregon. A particularly fierce El Nino was credited for assisting this phenomenon. Climatologists speculated that the heavy spring growth would make for dry fuel later in the season. In October of the same year, the warning proved true. A landscape once consumed by butterflies became engulfed in flames. The same hills of golden poppies were devoured in the inferno. Progressively worsening wild, wildfire se seasons and an increase of acreage burned over longer periods of time is an impact of climate change weathered by all Californians. As with the Painted Lady migration, greater abundance leads to greater loss. In September of 2020, the midst, in the midst of a global pandemic, images of orange skies flooded our vision. Unable to travel, landscapes beneath a pale and sullied auburn passed through our phones, as if the poppy's pigment was mixed with the grayish white of the smoke itself. The atmosphere did not smolder as it appeared to. A cold ash blanketed everything, and the smell of burning pine drifted across the continent. In these three instances of orange, the wings of the Painted Lady, the hills of California poppy, and the aftermath of wildfire skies, each turned to black. During the migration, the silhouette of painted ladies modeled marigold wings could belong to almost any genus, a shadow play floating through the sky like an inked animation. Across the rolling mountainsides of paper-like petals of the state flower were transmuted into puffs of smoke. While the fires raged and the sun set in an apocalyptic glow, the mood would shine a pallid apricot against the muted blackness. Um, so that's the beginning of the chapter, which really traces um, three instances of the color orange, but the whole chapter itself is actually about its uh, opposite, the color blue. And so I, I wanted to use the opportunity of us speaking to really get to this um, idea of blueness, which, which we explored in the chapter um, of all the sorts of emotional experiences, universal understandings of melancholy, loss, sadness, um, but also of the role of regeneration in your work. So um, let's talk about blue. Yeah, um, I loved your descriptions of blue in that essay. I feel like well, we could have the color, color, but we don't. Uh, you could read the whole chapter. I mean, there are there are so many histories of blue here, but a short amount of time. I know, people will just have to read it, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like the color blue um, creates a lot of distance and space in the work. And um, it's the color that recedes into the distance and the color that's so elusive in nature um, the sky, the ocean, light just filtering through atmosphere, scattering particles. Um, I guess I guess it feels like the most pure and essential color to me. It's it's crystalline, it's cold. Um, it's hard to explain, but it's really like it's a it's a feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think that that comes across. Um, in, I feel like it comes across in a way that's hard to um, to explain, even with like so many references, you know. 
Yeah. And, you know, one of the passages in the book too is about the description of how wildland firefighters actually uh, call the anatomy of a fire and um, they describe it in the anatomy of a serpent, right? So the, the head of the spread is, is sort of, the, it snakes through the landscape and the tail is, um, you know, often the point of origin and where the fire burns the hottest and that color is blue. Um, you know, we know that blue is the hottest part of, of a flame. So there are these um, sort of dichotomies in your work too, where the, the hotter an object is, the bluer it gets, like in the wildfire paintings, um, as opposed to the candles, which maybe have, you know, more of an iron oxide or this sort of metallic heat to them. Um, I wanted to ask you something that's not in the book, which is that you actually witnessed almost all of these phenomena of the butterflies migrating, of wildfires being um, a constant for anyone living in California, growing up in California. What have been your relationships to those natural phenomena? Like, do certain images or experiences stick in your mind? I mean, the past few years, especially, um, have been pretty intense climate wise. Um, it seems like every year it's, I don't know, it's almost like we're at this, at this breaking point of extreme conditions with earthquakes and fires and disappearing coastline and, um, Yeah, the butterfly migration that was in 2019. Um, I mean, it was it was pretty overwhelming. It's like every you look out the window and just see <laughs> hundreds hundreds swarming by, or you're on the freeway and they're just like surrounding your car. Um, it felt. Um, I guess there was a feeling of transcendence in like something feeling like happening or overtaking you. Um, yeah. Stephanie, where'd you go? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can hear everything you were saying. <laughs> I just, there's a little hummingbird outside my window. Perfect. <laughs> It's, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, so we talk about the color blue in in this chapter a lot, and of my knowledge of all of your exhibitions, there's really only one that has everything in this blue veil, which was wheeled at Casman um, in 2017, and um, one of the largest, you know, similar to the Cosmic Garden with the candles, there were these um, large sort of arched paintings that then had um, corresponding shields to them. And in each of the shields, there is um, a different hallucinogenic plant. And in this chapter, we go through all of the histories of those those plant species and um, what their effects were. Some of them are still in use, you know, like the opium poppy is a very popular one, um, but then there's also morning glory and uh, henbane and datura, also known as devil's, devil's snare. And um, the chapter really traces how each of these plants have disproportionately poisoned women. Um, in, a, in an attempt of ritual or um, sacred ceremonies. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of Belladonna, which is, translates from Italian to beautiful woman. And it was a poison that was administered as eye drops in order to dilate the pupils because that was a more attractive um, appearance for women and many of them went blind. And I know that you wrote a piece about Devil's Snare, um, like a really beautiful piece of writing that 
is part poem, part prose, part oh, an artwork as well. I was wondering if you could talk about your relationship to each of the hallucinogenic plants, how much you were looking into their history versus um, sort of using them as these as these symbols of protection in the shields. Sure. Um, yeah, I started thinking about the, these plants um, with the Cosmic Garden series, and then it expanded into that body of work that you just mentioned for Kasmin um, with the monuments and the shields. And um, the focus was on seven plants that I picked out of, you know, like a world of psychotropic plants. But um, these ones were specifically things that I found. They were either um, sort of like weeds, like things that you can come across more um, casually out in the world or things that had a more folkloric history that we don't know of as much. So it's sort of balanced between things that have, a, um, a, yeah, like more of a historical basis and things that have more of a um, contemporary significance. Um, so some are more well-known than others, I'd say. Um, but across the board, I think they continue to shift through time and from culture to culture, how we perceive them. Um, so they're sacraments, poisons, medicines, aphrodisiacs, if you believe in that. Um, for some people, they mean escape. For others, they mean discovery or healing. Um, for some people, they're criminal. Um, I'm coming to the plants with an interest in expanded consciousness and you know, similar to the candles or the hourglasses or even the guitars. I think that um, these are all instruments and tools that we use to help us navigate our experience of the natural world and um, make sense of existence and um, what that search is about and how we search, um, how we protect ourselves, how we explore. So, um, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking about the plants. Yeah, and the you know, devil snare in particular in the Spanish Inquisition, it sort of led to the witch hunt because it gives, um, when it's ingested, it gives this sort of delirium state and a sense of flying, but also um, its psychotropic property is that it divorces reality from fantasy. And now when you go on your walks in LA, you see it cropping up under the little uh, cracks in the sidewalk under the freeway, so. Right, I mean, I think what's, what's also so interesting about a plant like that is that it's, it's like the seed can remain dormant for so long underground. So a bird can carry the seed and for 10 years it can be um, just waiting and then this perfect storm of conditions and it um, sprouts and turns into this plant. And um, I think a lot of, you know, when we were talking about like these symbols that, that tend to recede and then reemerge and, and um, their continued power, I think, um, I think that that's it, that there's just like a, the plant as metaphor, I think, for that idea is mm -hmm. is there for sure. Yeah, I mean, two thoughts about that. Um, you know, one of the large questions that is asked in the chapter is, um, you know, all of these plants are depicted within shields. Um, so, what are they protecting? And it's this sort of um, cyclical return to narratives throughout culture that they're almost, um, they're continuing that narrative. So that's, that's one form of the protection. Um, but also because they're blue, I mean, the chapter begins with this, this quote um, from Goethe in his theories of colors, we love to contemplate blue, not because it advances to us, but because it draws us after it. Um, that's sort of where the moths come into play in this chapter is that, um, 
you know, like the paintings were like these moths that are sort of drawn closer to the flame, we're drawn into the image in a way um, that allows us to experience it, but also question where, why those images appear so familiar in these compositions that have never um, existed before. Um, also, because of our love for Joni Mitchell, there are quotes from Blue, from uh, lyrics in her album that are interspersed throughout the chapter. And I think that that, that whole album really gets to the duality of Blue as sort of um, a danger, but also um, being really comfortable and sort of embraced by the color and all of its emotions. Um, yeah, I think so too. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to move on to the next chapter, which is about um, all the musical instruments that you depict. Um, we spoke about, you mentioned the lyre distillation, um, the sort of ancient harp, uh, but there's also guitars and dulcimers, but all of these stringed instruments that um, reappear throughout your practice, snakes and moons. And one of the ways that each of these three things are um, that they come together and coalesce in the chapter is surrounding the ancient myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. And, um, you know, it's a pretty popular myth, but for those that aren't familiar, um, Orpheus and Eurydice are married. Um, Eurydice is bitten by a snake and dies and goes to the underworld. Um, Orpheus plays a song on his liar for entrance into Hades and it's so beautiful that the gods are moved by it and he is granted um, permission to go retrieve Eurydice from the underworld on the condition that as they're reascending towards um, earth he does not look back um, but he fails the instruction worries that she's not behind him he looks back and she vanishes forever um, so this chapter is really about, um, you know, how all of these symbols come together, but also, um, I mean, it's, it's really a chapter about, about female representation, I would say more than anything else, though it brings um, all of the elements of aesthetics and music and regression, like a sort of looking back of without getting too much into it, sort of the folk and glam movement that was stealing aesthetics from the symbolists and the pre-Raphaelites who were also stealing uh, symbols and styles from medieval art um, and illuminated manuscripts from the middle ages, which were then influenced by ancient Greek culture. So these sort of um, century lapses in, in how these, um, how these aesthetics change and morph over time and how your work um, also years later does sort of plug into this narrative. Um, so I'll read just a very small passage here um, that sets up that, that relationship. In the late 19th century, the societal powers that defined the governing economic and metaphysical interests of the Western world were being faced with a serious decline. The progressive failure of religious and governmental authority and the rise of feminism signaled a change in the centers of economic and moral power. Patriarchal, patriarchal authority, which controlled historical records and genealogy was in stark contrast to any feminine forces positioned against these structures, the natural, the cyclical, the ahistorical, or the subjective. And the spread of these latter qualities across Europe in the 1890s matched equally by a contempt and seduction. Um, the advent of the female figure of the femme fatale sexualizing this new se newly seized power as a means to diminish and control came into being. Lilith attempted Eve, Medusa turned men into stone, the, the serpent is a female archetype. If Orpheus was the savior, the snake that killed Eurydice was the villain. Though it was Orpheus who transgressed by looking back, it is Eurydice who vanishes, 
who was denied representation. Um, so with that, uh, I wanted to ask you, do you see your works as embodiments of these types of female archetypes? Um, I love that we both come to these themes from different angles and they find footing in the work. Um, what I draw from the myth of Orpheus specifically was this idea of the journey to darkness and back and the journey of a seed in the earth going underground and re-emerging. Um, as much as it's a story about love and loss and a life of singing, it's about nature and life cycles. So that's generative, there's light after the darkness. Um, but it's also a story about failure, which is understood through that motif of looking back, unable to bring his lover back to life. Eurydice in that moment is representative of um, all the things that can't be retrieved. And I find that duality through the process of painting, through loss and regeneration. So it, for me, it was a, a myth that sort of mirrored my own experience of making artwork and this very specific process of, um, or it was a very ex uh, specific experience of making, making these paintings. Mm -hmm. Um, I also wanted to ask about, I think another, I, I think another draw to the Orpheus myth is also his lyricality in the role of, of music. And one of the things that's also in this chapter are sort of all of the representations of, of that myth of him with his instrument. So it's really a representation of, of music, um, but the paintings are always mute. Um, but I wanted to ask about sort of your interest in music in folk and glam aesthetics. Um, I ask because there's, there are some um, direct representations of artists such as Todd Rundgren um, that sort of um, reach an androgyny in their performance where, you know, that, that's a very, new sort of persona and performance of gender that crops up in the 1970s through popular music, um, but it's also quoting these um, earlier aesthetics in symbolism um, in the 1890s um, and earlier. So what what sort of drew you to, I mean, I know that you love Todd, what, what drew you to Todd? And um, how did he become sort of your, your Orpheus and your Eurydice? Um, gosh, it's sort of hard to explain how or why certain things take hold, but I'll try. Um, he almost looks like you in some of the paintings too. So <laughs> it seems is like is Todd, is Todd, um, well, it's funny actually, cause there's a few portraits, um, that I've used that, um, they're really more like analogs, um, but they, always, or people always ask if they are me. Um, and so it, it seems to be something, maybe it's just like, um, I don't know, am I making them look like me? I hope not. <laughs> but um, what I was gonna say is that, that there's an emotional component to a lot of music that I find myself really drawn to. And it's like you're giving a window into someone's experience and you can share in that on an emotional level, even if you don't share the same story. And um, I don't have many figures in, in my work, but, um, but on a number of occasions I have drawn um, a figure out from hazy concert footage. Um, it's usually a singer songwriter. It's been, for example, Todd or Joni, um, they're sitting at their instrument um, you can feel that they're reaching something deep inside themselves and channeling that into something powerful that other people can feel. Um, and the footage is always so far removed from the original experience. Um, it's low resolution. Sometimes it's three screens removed. Someone has filmed it off of their television to share and then someone's filmed that. And so um, it almost feels so far away that it's like, it's like this 
shooting star or something just glowing in the distance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the original interest, you know, in the music and, and then that gets translated and further distance and removed. And so the end result is less about Todd or Joni or um, any other singer songwriter that may appear, but, um, but that original connection is there. And that's why it's sort of, that's like the genesis of it. But, but I feel like as the painting progresses and as it gets sort of filtered and pushed further away, it, it becomes this other thing, which is just um, a stand in for a feeling or of this idea of looking inward. Mm -hmm. It seems also this stand-in for for a figure that is um, unidentifiable. I mean, I just held up the the images of that you've painted of Todd, um, or that we know is Todd, and you know, even the the figure in here is so subtle. You know, they're not portraits in a conventional sense. Um, I don't even think that you can call them portraits at all. It's more that this this figure sort of arises like a specter out of the the paint. Um, but in a lot of ways, your paintings of moths are like more human than than these. Right. Um, okay, I wanted to move on to the final chapter, which is titled Mirrors, Gates, and Windows. Um, whole chapter is really about symmetry and how symmetry finds its footing in your practice, both uh, formally and conceptually. And um, the passage I'm going to read is about the history of the heart symbol and where that came from, um, and also how, how the narrative of how it came to be sort of um, echoes the, the symmetry in your work. Um, but then there's another passage that I'm not going to read that's about spirals um, and these bolt forms. So just to keep that in mind that the two main um, geometric markers of the chapter are, are the heart and the spiral, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. In the Middle Ages, Italian physicist Guido da Vigivano illustrated a series of anatomical drawings one of which depicted a heart similar to the ideographic symbol of the heart we know today, two curved lines indented in the center. In its graphic distillation, it is speculated that the shape was most likely derived from a description in the writings of Aristotle. In ancient Greece during the fourth century BC, the heart was believed to be the organ responsible for intelligence, motion, and the sensation of the body, essentially a mind. Guido's drawing was likely the result of a mistake based on the description of a heart-shaped seed from a lost genus of plant called silphium. Common around the Greek coastal colony of Cyrene in Northern Africa, modern Libya, silphium was said to have been the first effective abortificant. The ideogram of the plant became the ultimate symbol of sex, its seeds befitting a motif of the deity Cupid before it was superimposed onto ideals of courtship or romance. Latin adjectives meaning heart-shaped entered the lexicon, cordata, cordatum, cordatus. Images of the plant adorned Greek coins. The Romans wrote the species into poems, songs, and literature. Perfume was made from its blooms and its sap became worth its weight in gold. It seems that the indentation or fold in the base of the heart first appeared in Northern Italy in the years of the early 14th century. Since attempts to cultivate the herb in captivity failed and the species would have died out by the time Guido's drawings passed into circulation. The heart was the result of an error originally made in, a in an anatomical text. In the 16th century, an anatomists finally corrected the error but by that time, the scalloped heart icon as we know it today had become so established in the visual arts of the Renaissance that it could no longer be eradicated. The symmetry of the icon has inflected our emotional understanding of the organ. It can be split down the middle, heartache, 
It can expand or contract, heartbeat. It can be a marker of deceit, cheating heart, vulnerability, heart on your sleeve, noble acts, a heart of gold, or the sacred, set aflame. It is something to give, something to steal. The metaphoric potentials imposed upon the symbol belong to the extremities of the human experience, love, sex, and the sacred. In the case of Theodora Allen's work, these limits are approached through the secular, although their intensity as symbols remain. An indication of life, a ticking clock, the heart keeps time until it doesn't. Um, when did you choose the heart and why? I mean, did you see it as, as a depiction of love or which of the um, sort of many ways of the heart symbol did you first come to use it as, as a frame for your work? And just to describe that for, for some of the audience, um, there's often these heart-shaped frames that will hold other symbols in your work or they'll be cracked open um, like eggs almost. Mm -hmm. I think the first heart was for a sh the, my first show Blum and Poe in 2015. And um, it was, an early version of those distillation paintings it was a little bit different and that it didn't interlock in the same way, but it was sort of built into, it was sort of an armature and um, with space that felt like a, a window in, or a screen into another space. Um, I think initially it was about um, an idea of like devotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm i not as interested in like pinning it down to um, just an idea about romantic love. Um, I think it's, I think it stands in for something bigger, larger than that, but, um, but Yeah, I think um, I'm sticking with that word, devotion. <laughs> devotion to the image or devotion to, um, I mean, it's such an interesting word. It's like devotion to what? I guess a devotion to, I mean, it can be a devotion to any number of things, but a devotion to the search Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's that's sort of what we discover in the history of, you know, looking into it. I mean, I wanted to understand the where the ideograph came from. And originally when starting the chapter, I thought, well, but the heart is, you know, maybe a trite symbol that it's... Um, something that's ubiquitous, but it's actually, um, I mean, my interest in it and, and what I discovered through writing is that it embodies these, con these absolute contradictions on the most extreme sphere of human experience, um, love and hate, um, religion and secularity, romantic love versus, um, you know, a love for not a person, but a thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, it was, I think, a really um, fascinating rabbit hole to go down. And um, in your in your more recent works, the screw or the machine bolt um, are the newest ones that are in the exhibition, and those are also covered in in this chapter because um, with the mirroring and the symmetry of, of the heart, there's also a discussion of gates and windows. And um, 
it's essentially a chapter about the architecture of your paintings and how one passes through or is kept out um, by their compositions um, and, the, and the framing elements that make up the, the image. Um, and so in all of these paintings of the bolts, um, they're called life thread uh, series and they really appear like these sort of columns that are holding up the, the composition in some ways, but they could also be um, gates that are you know, pushing you away so that what you see is, is purely on the surface. Um, it has less of the quality that you could walk into those paintings as say the Cosmic Garden mm -hmm. uh, series or, um, or the images from Weald, for example. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how you came onto the the bolt because you know a lot of a lot of our early conversations were that these were like a complete departure and um, you know people saw these as like very different paintings uh, but at the same time conceptually like they they hold the same weight um, and they are these these essential. Um, Tools. They're one of the six original simple machines. So they're no different or industrial than say um, some of the other symbols that you're working right. with. Well, that's, question one is how did you come to the bolt? And then I wanna talk about the titling of all of the life threads um, with Asclepius, which is um, the Greek god of medicine, sort of the snake wrapping around the, the pole. Yeah. I remember the first time we talked about the the bolts, the screws. Um, you said something like, "Oh, it's an industrial snake." <laughs> Did I? Love it? I was like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> um, I love that description. Um, <laughs> I should have put that in the book. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I feel like. Um, you know, with this sort of language of symbolic um, imagery, these are, I guess in some ways they seem surprising because they feel like they're, they're, um, they're lacking that sort of like organic or um, um, they're lacking a, or they're sort of like a, a harder edge or something that maybe feels more masculine or, um, but I think that, I mean, if you think about the screw as this, as the spiral and this like the original symbol um, and being something that um, I think, well, in those paintings, they're, they're almost like these columns that are holding up the composition. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, um, they have this dual function of being this, um, this emblem as well as this very like um, having a formal purpose in the painting, which is to um, support, you know, as an architectural column, like the, uh, the sort of structure that's built around it. Um, and the structure around it involves these um, hawk moths, which have sort of metamorphosized from other paintings where they are uh, appear in this more like realist fashion. And then these have, these have um, yeah, shifted into this um, almost like, I guess they're more of like ornament in the space, but if you're thinking about them as machines, it's almost like they are the, the cogs that are that the screw is um, catching on, um, and then those are the pollinators for for the datura plant, which are in the outermost compartments. Um, and so it's I'm thinking of them as like this a system, um, and how those things fit together. And I think it expands that symbolic lexicon and that it maybe is it's pushing it in a direction that feels um i guess a little more idiosyncratic or personal 
but but really it's still rooted in these these very um, elemental um, and universal um, symbols like the spiral. It's interesting that you said that it at first it sort of appeared male. And one of the, you know, one of the passages in the book also follows the terminology of both hardware and pollination, um, because it's sort of the essential thing about the bolts and the life threads are that they are framed by the moth and the flower. Um, and also this idea of the male and female part or screws um, and bolts, which is the male plugs into something and the female part is just this vacuous um, threaded piece that holds, that really holds the composition together. I mean, without it, um, that holds things together without um, something to screw into, the, the screw has no use. Um, so it, we, I talk about it in terms of this, um, you know, how male and female really be, become I guess weaponized is the right word in terms of like vacuity and penetration and how um, but how one needs one needs the other, but language has set it up in a this one does it and this one does not. Um, and for the devil snare, you know, one of the, the the only reason it can only be pierced by the hawk moth is that it it's the only one with the long enough proboscis to get into the trumpet. Um, but I think it's well, that's. Uh, yeah. Oh no, you go. I was just going to say that's where the title. I think if we're going to bring, you know, <laughs> explain where the title comes into it, life thread. Um, it's about that um, process of um, those life cycles and um, birth and um, yeah. Yeah, one of the paintings, I remember where the hawk moth actually came from, the the, um, the distillation of the moths, I think was in the painting that we included in a group show called Saturnine, where there was an hourglass um, mm. framed by this sort of freeze of, well, this was butterflies, but maybe it was butterflies, maybe moths. Right, yeah, that was, those were different, but it was a similar sort of, um, um, framing device. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's where these sort of like the metal inlays um, came into play. Um, but I think- Or that, that shifting from um, taking something out of that uh, illusionistic space and putting it into a graphic space. Mm -hmm. And I think actually the hourglass is a really nice symbol to land on. I mean, you call all of these, the hourglasses calendars and, um, you know, they're calendars that are frozen in time at the same time. So they're almost capturing these moments, these moments in space. And so I was just, um, I was just checking the, the Q&A to see if we had any questions um, from people watching. But maybe we can close out on, on a brief discussion of the hourglass before wrapping up. I mean, do you see them as stopping time or is it more that the the image of the hourglass frozen at a specific point um, becomes that stillness. Maybe that's an obvious question. Oh, did you ask me a question? <laughs> Sorry. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. Like, what did you say? <laughs> 
Oh boy, I don't even remember. Um, <laughs> it was about, you know, just to close out on hourglasses, like the, because they're called calendars, like, do they, do they, do they relate to you to specific moments in time? I'm going to revise my question. Oh, okay. Or is the, still um, the fact that they just imbue a stillness um, enough? I guess I'm thinking up and so I'm wondering if they relate I actually never got to ask you this if they relate to specific moments in in your life or in time that you wanted to still um no not so much that I think that um I th I'm thinking about reducing these shapes into um, like what the language, how, how those sort of like, what's the word like, um, like a pictographic form stands in place of an object, let's say. So mm -hmm. that the infinity symbol is this thing that loops forever. And then if you compress that slightly, that's that same as the hourglass shape, but the hourglass shape runs out or the hourglass runs out. So, but it's also reversible. So mm -hmm. it has um, potential or hope attached to it as well. It's not just, um, it's not just, you know, that's it, time has run out. Um, but um, broadly, a lot of these symbols are markers of time. And, um, and so it's, it's like continuing that thought from painting to painting. And um, yeah. I think that's a perfect place to end. Um, thank you so much for well, first to everybody who's watching and also to Theo um, for taking the time for us to actually speak through the book for the first time since it's been published. Um, for anyone that is looking for a copy, um, it is available at the Kusla Arhus alongside the exhibition um, by the same name and also available for shipping worldwide through um, Moto Books. And if you are stateside, uh, Kasman and Blum and Poe Gallery also have copies. Um, yeah, this is a real treat to speak through it today. Thanks, Stephanie. All right. Thank you, everyone. And